synopsis for this presentation is that we are going to talk about artificial lift technology. They are the mainstay for producing oil and gas wells around the globe. And profitability is closely linked with these technologies. Whether you're talking about conventional or unconventional fields, the training for which um, uh, this webinar is based upon, from which this webinar is based upon, is a lot more comprehensive. And in the available time frame, we are going to touch upon some of the trends, uh, some of the very quick introductory things about artificial lift. I'll also touch upon uh, some of the advanced topics like uh, what happens in unconventional or what happens with the digital oil field and so on and so forth. So with that uh, uh, synopsis in place, this is our agenda. As I said, uh, we'll touch upon this introductory unconventional post-COVID accelerators for artificial lift. Uh, and the last topic is being talked about a lot. Uh, and in that area, I have um, been working for some time, nothing to do with COVID, but what are the artificial lift accelerator like digital oil field and such. Uh, part of these presentations um, I have presented as my distinguished lecturer series for Society of Petroleum Engineers, uh, particularly the topic number two and part of the topic number three. Uh, again, this is going to be a very quick and fast introduction to the topic uh, that can take five days or more. So let's uh, dive right into it. So the first thing we are going to look at it is what, where, why, when, and how of artificial lift. Um, as you can see here, each oil or gas well life cycle follows certain pattern, quick ramp up, and then there is a plateau or slightly declining plateau, and then there is a sharply de declining plateau here. So when you uh, look at uh, this type of production behavior, you can see that uh, typically artificial lift is applied um, typically once we, we start the decline phase. Now, having said that, you also need to keep in mind that uh, for the production acceleration reasons, some people begin applying artificial lift to an oil or gas well from the day one. And we'll briefly touch upon this. But one thing, one takeaway from this graphic for you is that most of the oil and gas wells in the world they stay on the artificial lift for very, very long time period. And that is the importance of this topic for you. Uh, if we uh, talk about, uh, uh, if we, let me get rid of uh, this drawing tool. If we uh, talk about unconventional, unconventional story is no different, again, but but there are some characteristics of unconventional oil and gas production that has even made artificial lift a lot more important compared to before. So now let's uh, uh, dive right into uh, the USA where I'm based out of. Uh, as you can see from this survey from World Oil, there are about 35%, 95%, not 35, 95% of the oil wells are on artificial lift. And that statistic has been constant uh, ever since World Oil started publishing it. They have stopped publishing these statistics for now two, three years, but uh, my informal surveys have revealed that the percentage of the wells on the, uh, on the artificial lift uh, is remaining steady at about 95%. In some cases, it has even increased. Worldwide, uh, again, the statistics is very, very difficult to come by. This picture was put together by one service company around 2013, more than seven years ago. I can tell you one thing uh, based on, again, my informal surveys, the number of the worldwide artificial lift wells is close to a million. Uh, within US, the number is fairly stagnant, around half a million, slightly more than half a million, maybe 600,000, but around the world, the number has been on increase. Actually, I have personally worked with some of the clients in different parts of the world where I know for a fact that the number of wells on the artificial lift are a lot higher. So we can take it to that more than a million wells around the world are on artificial lift, okay? So why do you need artificial lift system? Production acceleration is one thing that I mentioned earlier. 
but then you also have to look at it uh, the natural factor like uh, as the brown field the production gets tired then you have to think of the reservoir pressure decline you have to think of increasing water cut you have to think of uh, gas cap exertion essentially your productivity declines and then if you have objective of managing your production maintaining production at certain level then that is where you look to the artificial lift system as you go for infill drilling as you implement uh, the enhanced oil recovery strategies then also oftentimes you have to deploy some of the artificial lift uh, system uh, so overall um, people say that yeah whenever we want to do production optimization we need artificial lift and production optimization is a kind of catch-all term it could be production maintenance but uh, later on i'll explain to you why it is more than that so when do you need artificial lift uh, very uh, simply put uh, we have two boundaries wellhead pressure and reservoir pressure at two end of the spectrum and re reservoir pressure is the motive force and wellhead pressure is the opposing force then we have some more opposing forces along the well bore so we need artificial lift to overcome all those uh, boundary challenges namely we need to have sufficiently higher reservoir pressure to push through the well bore pressure losses and push against the well head pressure losses for a desired quantity so when you require higher than natural flow quantities or when your fluids fail to reach at the surface then you require artificial lift and um, so one simple way to put this is inequality whenever the pressure at the bottom here is less than what you require to overcome the pressure losses and the wellhead pressure you require artificial lift and if you follow navier stokes or some uh, equation like that you, eventually you will come up with this type of uh, partial differential or differential equations depending upon your free body that you are considering but the main point is that you have to overcome elevation losses friction losses and in some cases very few cases you have to overcome acceleration losses and why it is important to understand is this that what is the dependency of this elevation losses the primary dependency is the density of the fluid. In case of friction losses, it is the velocity of the fluid that you have to pay attention to and some of the uh, friction coefficient. So one of the thing is that the artificial lift is closely interrelated with the fluid flow dynamics, also the discipline of nodal analysis. You have to understand a little bit of mechanical engineering, some electrical engineering, um, in general you have to also pay attention to what are your facilities how do they work uh, if you are going to focus on operations believe it or not uh, right now in this covid era most of the production engineers that are being called back to work in office or in the field are focused on some of these artificial lift issues like which wells to shut down which wells needs to be uh, brought back on the line in what manner what should be the ramp up uh, what is the danger if we do not shut down one particular well or if we shut down the wrong wells so this knowledge is very very useful now uh, the picture that i showed you earlier was uh, onshore but the artificial lift challenges are equally applicable for offshore subsea step up type of wells even it gets even more challenging because you do not have to only overcome well bore losses but also you have to overcome some of the seabed to the top side losses uh, in case of subsea. Um, uh, so you have to consider these flow line losses as well as the well board losses. An artificial lift is needed to overcome some of these losses when the reservoir energy has been de has declined or has been depleted. Now, the basic uh, uh, basic uh, problem is the same. Uh, in the uh, sense that uh, how do we provide additional total dynamic head so that the reservoir fluids flow from well bore to the process facilities whether it's onshore offshore deep water subsea and so you need to if nothing else remember artificial lift is all about providing this total dynamic head or tdh um, uh, let me uh, go to the next slide 
and try to explain it slightly better. So what does artificial lift do? Um, artificial lift basically, uh, before uh, we do that, let me get rid of this. And as I said earlier, we have reservoir boundary, we have wellhead boundaries, and in normal conditions, uh, well might be flowing at certain flow rate. Uh, over the time, what is going to happen is our reservoir pressure is going to decline, water cut may increase. Uh, essentially, the available energy in the form of, uh, represented by the bottom of flowing pressure, decreases such that your fluids do not come to the surface, or when they come to the surface at much, at smaller quantity than what you'd like. So what artificial lift does, uh, you, once you lower artificial lift, uh, whichever mechanism you lower it, it basically helps you boost up the pressure from what is provided by the reservoir normally to a value that will help the flow quantities to come to the surface. So artificial lift provides this TDH or the boost or total dynamic head from whatever depth the artificial lift is lowered to the surface. So all of a sudden now you see the parameters that are involved in the process of lift selection. What type of lift method, at what depth I'm going to lower it, what should be the parameter I need to keep in mind. And some of these parameters change with the time. So how do I keep on that, right? So one of the tools that uh, we have traditionally used nodal analysis that relies on inflow outflow performance, whereby this green curve is showing the inflow curve. By the way, x-axis is the flow rate and y-axis is the pressure. In this particular case, we are showing the inflow and outflow performance curve at the middle of the perforation step. And green curve, as I was saying earlier, is the inflow curve or representing the reservoir energy. Blue curve is representing the outflow curve or what are the wellbore losses and the surface losses. Whenever these two in curves intersect, what we have is a stable equilibrium or the uh, operating point. And to the left of the operating point, we have more reservoir energy. To the right of this operating point, we have less reservoir energy, meaning this is the energy that uh, artificial lift needs to supply or they need to provide, artificial lift needs to provide this boost. This is in the simplest possible form I can explain the function of the artificial lift. Now, as I said earlier, this inflow and outflow curves are at one point in time. Now, if you are thinking of future, what happens when my reservoir pressure declines? What happens when my productivity index uh, changes? What happens if my water cut changes? What happens when my gas oil ratio changes? What happens when I am deciding to change the tubing? So all of these questions comes up and that is what I say here, things do change. And what changes impact my selection, design, and most importantly, operation of artificial. These some of these themes we'll explore in the class. So now that we have looked at what, where, why, how, um, next let me give you a quick uh, overview of uh, some of the lift methods. And again, uh, feel, you'll feel like you're sitting in the bullet train and the stations are passing by because that's all the time we have. And I want to uh, go away with a couple of ideas here that all the lift methods are good methods when they are applied in the right context. Sometimes people say, I don't like ESP or I don't like gas lift because it doesn't work for me. Then the question you should ask is that, are we applying it correctly? Have we made the right choice here? Another thing to keep in mind is that the lift method that was good yesterday may not be good today or it may not be good tomorrow. Meaning you have to be thinking about changes. You have to think about what is changing in my environment that will impact my lift selection, lift operation. So we have to understand reservoir, we have to understand field conditions today, tomorrow, and over the lifespan, whether we are selecting, designing, or operating artificial lift. And another thing that I would like to highlight is that in order to understand all the artificial lift, you have to understand the hydraulics, as I said earlier, fluid mechanics. You have to understand mechanical, electrical, and some of the environmental. And what do I mean by environmental constraint is not only uh, related to the harm to the ambient. We are talking about 
what type of environment exists inside the valve bore, what type of pressure, temperature, what are the corrosives, what are the scale, and what type of environment do we have in our company. So with that, now let me give a quick overview of there are different types of lift liquids. And what I'm going to do is that showing you on this one uh, slide, uh, most popular form of artificial lift methods uh, that are uh, typically being considered. In the classroom, we'll talk about also the lift methods that are um, not as uh, popular, but that are more in the experimental in the nature. So what you're looking at from the top uh, left corner is the rod pumping, where you are using rod to reciprocating motion. The next one in the middle where my cursor is hovering is the progressing cavity pump or PCP. The one next to it right is the electrical submersible pumping. The one in the middle of the screen on the far right is the hydraulic piston or hydraulic jet pump. Then coming back to the bottom left is the gas lift. Then comes the plunger lift. Then comes the uh, foam injection. So in our tool chest of the artificial lift methods, we have variety, variety of uh, lift methods. And uh, let me turn off my webcam in case uh, this causes some quality issues for you. Okay, uh, so this is uh, one view. In one shot, you're looking at all the major lift methods. And in the class, that is what we are going to discuss, different lift methods, what are their pluses, what are their minuses, what is the applicability, what are the design considerations, what are the operational considerations and such. So uh, let me uh, give you some flavor. Um, again, these are all the same lift methods that you are looking at. Uh, on the left side, I have segregated plunger, foam, and gas lift. On the right side, I have rod pump, piston pump, progressing cavity pump, jet pump, and ESP. Meaning all of these have pump. All the methods on the right side, they have pump in their name. Uh, they are primarily driven by energy that is supplied from the surface to the device that is lowered inside the valve bore. The methods on the left, they rely more on the reservoir uh, energy. So they are driven primarily by the reservoir energy, okay? So now here's a quiz question and I we are not going to poll the audience, but these are the type of quizzes that we'll be doing, a short quizzes to keep the fun, things fun and interesting. There'll be some trivias, some serious uh, question answer. And of course, there'll be some exercises that we'll be also performing in the class that will require, that will allow you to understand uh, how to properly design or analyze an artificial lift. So here the question is, which lift type has maximum number of installations worldwide? And you have seen all the eight methods. And if your answer is number four, reciprocating rod lift, then pat yourself on the back for me. Uh, that is the correct answer. Now let's talk about uh, 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 commercial side of it. Who are the service providers? What is the size of the market? And why do we care? Because when we understand what is the size of the market for the commercial service provider, that tells us uh, what are the prevalent trends. Uh, and here I have some research published by one company from Tulsa, Oklahoma, Spears and Associate. Um, and that shows that, okay, Baker Hughes, Schlumberger, Weatherford, Dover and Borets, they were the dominant players in 2017. Since then, we have had some name changes, some acquisitions and such, and now you'll find Halliburton jumping in the top three or maybe top five, and Dover has become a PRG. But one message that I want you to have is that whether there is an up market or down market, artificial lift segment does not suffer as greatly like the other service sectors. It goes down, but it doesn't go down that severely. And when it comes back, it comes back. Because as I said earlier, you require artificial lift throughout the life cycle of the valve. So even though there may not be new lift installations coming in, but um, operators will continue to have to invest in existing valves, existing lift methods and such. Moving on, another quiz for you very quick. Uh, if we look at the total uh, production worldwide, which two lift technologies would be producing the most oil? And again, I have given all the eight choices from before. Um, 
if you have narrowed down your choices here comes the answer the answer is esp and gas lift and that also gives you some idea about the capabilities of some of this lift method. Uh, something that I cannot uh, discuss here in this class is that what are the classification of the lift depending upon the production abilities? Like I can tell you that electrical submersible pump and gas lift are being used in some of the highest liquid volume producing wells. On the other hand, plunger lift and foam lift is being used in some of the lowest producing liquid producing well, meaning we have a, a spectrum of flow rate to consider spectrum of reservoir energy to consider whenever we are considering uh, artificial lift, whether it's a selection, design or operation, okay? So the issues that we'll explore in the class that I've been hinting at, like things like this, that why the rod pumping is most used method or why ESP and gas lift are the method that are used to produce the most oil. We'll examine different lift method from the perspective of what are the challenges when is the best time to select the lift method time related factors by the way something is going on here okay so time related factors that impact selection design and operation these are uh, some of the interesting aspect of the lift that we need to okay now let me uh, show you a very high level artificial lift technology selection and application process. It's a very, very high level in the sense uh, just to accommodate the time constraint that we have. So it always starts with understanding what type of reservoir we are dealing with, what type of valve bore, and one of the primary tool is the nodal analysis. We look at what are the target production levels. We understand and predict the reservoir potential. And we need to understand what are the surface constraint? What are the reservoir constraint? How much of fluid we, we can withdraw? Once we know all of that, then we go into lift selection process and eliminate uh, the lift technologies that are not feasible based on the required performance, based on what is the infrastructure available, and so on and so forth. Once we have selected a lift method, then we need to do some economic evaluation. Which lift map? Because typically after step two, you'll have maybe two or three lift methods that would be applicable. Then you look into the economic analysis aspect of it. Um, what are the costs related to installing the equipment, related to capture, getting that equipment, and what it will take uh, to train my people in using that equipment properly what are the operating costs what is the reliability and so on and so forth and then comes the most important aspect once you are in the operations how do you optimize the lift method so that the lift method continues to work reliably without undue failures uh, unexpected failures how do we continue to tweak our wells operation so that we get our desired outcome and that's where there are lots of approaches that uh, are being talked a lot about now in post-COVID era, where people talk about remote operations, uh, uh, adjusting the things um, uh, remotely by using the expertise uh, of some consultants or some experts who are scattered across the globe. And that those are the post-COVID accelerators that I was hinting at, but I will come back to that theme quickly. So now let's take a look at some of the important lift methods. And again, I'll be able to spend only one or two slides, whereas in the classroom, we'll be spending close to two to three hours just discussing each of this, and even longer depending upon the interest. So you're looking at uh, three gas lift wells. Actually, there are more than three on this pad. But on the picture, you are seeing that uh, in one of the unconventional fields here in US, right? So when you look at the gas lift, it's uh, closest to the naturally flowing well. You can see in naturally flowing wells, what you are seeing is that as the fluids flow upwards, uh, the gas comes out of the solution, which reduces the weight of the fluid column, and that in turn reduces the uh, bottom hole pressure. In gas lifted well, what we are doing is that we are injecting the gas into the uh, well bore. Uh, and in this particular case, we are injecting inside the casing tubing annulus. And then there are some special devices that we lower on the tubing string that allows that gas to enter the production stream. In this case, the production stream is tubing. 
uh, enter the production stream uh, at desired quantity and whatever. So again, gas lift valve is an extension of a naturally flowing valve. And all this injection gas does is it reduces the density of the mixture. And if you recall that differential equation that I presented earlier, majority of the losses in a valve bore are related to the elevation losses. And elevation losses are highly influenced by the density of the mixture. So uh, this gives you one of the uh, reasons why gas lift can be a popular lift method. There is no device that is lowered it that obstructs the flow rate and such. I can go on and on, but we do not have enough time. But in terms of the downhole components, you have to think in terms of what is called a mandrel or a kind of a holder in which a gas lift valve is lowered. In this particular case, we are looking at what is called a side pocket mandrel, but there is also conventional mandrel uh, and such. There are different types of gas lift valve injection pressure operated, production pressure operated and such. And we'll be discussing in the class uh, how these different types of uh, valves are used in wonder what conditions, which is the most popular one that is being used. But one takeaway for you from this seminar is that the gas lift design involves the depth selection. At what depth you are going to lower this valve, meaning at what depth you will have the mandrel located. What is the size of the orifice inside the valve that allows the gas quantity, certain gas quantity? How do you manage uh, the design or how do you develop the design so that uh, multiple valves are not operating at the same time and we are using the effective gas volume to reduce the density the most. And those are some of the interesting, not only design, but operational challenges as well. During the operation, you might be wondering, hey, am I injecting correct quantity at the correct location? What is going on if I'm not? How do I find out? And these are uh, some interesting, but coming back to the operation, what do we want to achieve? We want to continuously optimize the gas usage and production so that we are not wasting the energy. Uh, we are preventing the multi-point injection. We are injecting the gas through the lowest possible gas lift valve. Uh, we do not want to inject smaller amount of gas so that we cannot, uh, if we inject smaller amount of gas, then we are deferring the production, meaning we are not lifting as much of production as is possible. If we inject a lot more gas, then we are wasting our compression energy. Uh, and in some extreme cases, we can even end up cutting down on the production because excess gas would increase the flow friction and it may reduce the production rate. So uh, some of this optimization approaches also come into when you go into the operation. How much do I inject? Am I injecting at the last uh, correct position or not? Okay. So uh, if I had to uh, give you just one wrap up, uh, gas lift is applicable in all types of locations in, under all types of completion, whether you're talking about horizontal, deviated well, vertical well, remote location, subsea wells, offshore, whether you have naturally flowing wells, you can use still gas lift or your thermal wells are also used. Uh, it can handle wide range of production rate, even though earlier I said, and this bullet says that gas lift is good for high production rate. I have come across in my career wells that are producing less than 10 barrels of liquid with the gas lift. Naturally, gas lift has a gas in it, meaning it likes the gas. And here is one secret that most of the pumping methods do not like the gas. Uh, so high GOR situations um, really um, are preferred uh, candidates for gas lift application. Whenever you have highly variable production rate, again, gas lift shines. When you do not have sufficient well data, like when you are in the field development stage, you do not have any previous information, then people often go with the gas lift for that purpose. There are some operational aspects you have to consider also that how do I chain this well, uh, valves? Uh, then that is where if you use the side pocket type of mantle, you can just use the wire line. Whereas if you use what is called conventional mandrel that is often being used in onshore, then you have to call a workover rig at the valve site to pull out all the valves and the mandrel. So 
you have to think about those issues also as you select or as you decide to design or operate right so this was a very quick uh, intro to the gas lift now let's look at another lift method called electrical submersible pump and as this picture shows at the surface uh, esp well might uh, be confused for gas lift wells except you might see there is some cable entering into the valve board as is shown here or in the graphic uh, in the schematic uh, here it also shows uh, that there is some paraphernalia there may be some transformers here uh, some controller boards some uh, variable speed drives junction box and then there is a cable that is taken all the way to the bottom because esp devices are hung at the end of the tubing and that is another clue for you that esp is whenever you have to change or lower in most of the time you have to lower the you have to have a work over rig on the side and that is one of the challenge that industry is trying to tackle now that can we lower the esp without the work over rig and there are some solutions being tried and it has some pluses and some minuses we can discuss all of that uh, when we have more time um, another thing is that uh, we have to select the system so that they stay in the hole the longest because we do not want to call the rig that often so what are the best practices how do you operate the system that doesn't close here i'm showing you a simple animation developed by petrobras on the gas lift uh, no, sorry not gas lift esp wells and um, in the class we'll be looking at a lot more such animations for each and every lift methods and such um, what we are looking at here is a esp cable coming down the tubing and it will terminate where we have the motor here and below the motor we have a gauge pack sensor pack above the motor we have protector or seal section and then we have entry point or intake or the separator and then we have pump uh, the verb that you see is in portuguese uh, if you understand but um, otherwise uh, most of this is very self-explanatory uh, once the motor is energized uh, there is a shaft inside the motor that starts rotating clockwise and that is what leads to the shaft inside the protector turn and then that leads to the shaft shaft runs or connected system of shaft comes all the way to the pump up here there is a separation going on and then now you see the centrifugal removing rotor um, uh, and impellers here that shows you the centrifugal motion that happens and um, and basically this is the device that generate again remember the keyword what i said earlier tdh or total dynamic head and that is uh, the total dynamic head is the one that uh, we are after in artificial lift design or operation okay so as i said we'll be uh, looking at some of this animation this is a very quick cutout view of what is one stage and stage comprises of what is called diffuser and impeller which is rotating on a shaft that comes all the way from motor as you saw in the animation so pump moves the fluid by rotating them with rotating impeller and that is uh, the dynamics here we are looking at uh, the pump sitting on top of motor now you see me speeding up because i'm looking at the clock here and it looks like we are already on to 40 minutes uh, out and uh, so what we are seeing here are different components and uh, these are the different components that needs to be discussed uh, understood in order to properly apply them in order to properly understand their operations and once we have lowered the esp we have to see what is the interplay between motor and cable and uh, pump and so on so uh, we can also solve some of the examples to understand that interplay this slide summarizes uh, again esp application high volume high valve high value valves right uh, uh, they they anytime you have uh, you're considering situation that you want to produce more than three four thousand barrels or so 
you how to consider ESP. And nowadays we have ESPs that can produce as low as 500 barrels or even lower than that. So this is a also a versatile lift method. We have other lift method, rod lift. Again, rod lift is uh, one of the most uh, predominant because it is being used as a symbol in our industry, right? And I can keep on talking about each and every component here, but the primary idea is that you have here a prime mover, usually an engine or a motor that has a circular motion, and then you have a lever system here, what is called pumping unit, which converts that circular motion into the reciprocating motion. And reciprocating motion is conveyed to the pump, which is uh, maybe seven, eight, 10,000 feet below the surface via a string of rods that is called sucker rods. And then there's a polished rod that comes out of the valve bore uh, through the stuffing box. So we will be discussing some of these uh, components and what is their importance and how they offer the value chain. Here, there is a quick uh, animation of uh, what happens downhole. There is a something called traveling wall that moves up and down with the rod movement up and down. Uh, and then there is a standing wall which allows the fluid to enter this barrel. So uh, there are some design considerations. There are some operational consideration uh, that are very, very important uh, to understand this motion. Okay, uh, here you're looking at a number of pumping units, uh, surface arrangements that are possible uh, for the rod pumping. And um, uh, in classroom, we'll be able to look at uh, each of them. Uh, what are the underlying geometrical consideration and what are the benefits, disadvantages? Rod string is another important uh, consideration, uh, whether there are jointed sucker rods or there are conventional API rods or high strength rods that are provided by vendors. And then we have also what is called the continuous rods or core rod. So in rod pumping operation side, we want to produce continuously as much as reservoir will provide. What we are talking about is matching the reservoir deliverability with the pumping systems abilities, right? We want to avoid uh, some injurious conditions, what is called fluid pound. And we can discuss what is the impact of the fluid pound on the overall operations. How do you detect that fluid pound is happening or not? How do we remedy that situation? and how do we notice a malfunction and such, okay? So rod lift, again, as I said earlier, rod lift is used in maximum number of wells. All of them are onshore, and why it is onshore, and why we cannot use it in offshore. Uh, what type of um, uh, wells the rod lift is most amenable to? And the answer is in all types of wells, except as long as it's not offshore or subsea type of application. Um, I have seen rod lift uh, installations produce as less as uh, one barrels or even less of liquid. And some of them have produced as high as two to 3000 barrels. And that kind of gives you an idea that rod lift is middle of the road uh, type of. There are other lift methods like hydraulic pumping jet and piston pump. Unfortunately, we do not have enough time to go into all of these details, but here you see surface arrangement is different. We'll talk about how the downhole arrangement is different. What are the different hydraulic consideration? This is another lift method, progressing cavity pump, which is the youngest kid on the block in the sense that this was introduced into the oil patch in 70s in the last century, whereas some of the other lift methods has been around for more than 100 years or so. Okay, then uh, we'll also talk about gas wells. What is the importance of artificial lift in the gas well life cycle? It all begins with the deliquification, de right? And there are different variety of deliquification option. And what is the deliquification? Removing the liquid from the well bore. And there are multiple things, as you can see here in the staircase pattern, uh, starting from the free flowing well through swabbing or intermitting through foam lift, using something called velocity string, surface compression, plunger lift, multi-stage plungers, gapple, which is a relatively becoming more and more popular here, particularly in the unconventional patch, and rod lift ESP. So we can talk about selection considerations and uh, so on and so forth. Here is a picture of the foam lift. We are not going to be able to talk in detail about that, uh, that how you use surfactant to change the surface tension 
to change the density. Here is a picture uh, from uh, Colorado area, Rockies area for plunger lift wells and how plunger lift um, in my estimation has uh, probably the second largest number of wells in the world on plunger lift, I would say. Um, then there are some other lift methods which are not typically considered lift, but they are gaining more and more prominence, particularly as you talk about some of the screw pumps, which is not same as the PCP or progressing cavity pump. Then there are helicoaxial pump, and these are a special purpose, what is called multi-phase pumping application that can handle wide range of gas and liquid envelopes. And that is, uh, these are have been primarily developed in subsea application, but now, we are beginning to see people asking about them in uh, mature fields as well. Uh, there is a surface compression that I mentioned earlier. So we have covered about 10 to 12 different ways of lifting uh, methods. Now let's uh, quickly switch the gears and talk about unconventional because unconventional brought us some of the challenges that force us to rethink our approach towards the artificial lift. When we try to apply artificial lift as is, in unconventional, we had higher amount of failures. And the primary reason is the lateral geometries that we have in the unconventional, which uh, generates some flow structures, which uh, a traditionally artificial lift systems are not able to handle. And what do I mean by flow structures? Here you see longer term production pattern of an unconventional well. Within the period of about three months or so, you have sharp decline in the liquid rate, you have sharp increase in the gas quantity. Um, so there is a phase change happening and the quantity change is happening. Just amount of three months in the period of three months, okay? And uh, over the shorter time period here, you can see that uh, there are large liquid slug followed by large gas bubbles coming into the well bore. Now, artificial lift systems are not traditionally uh, sized or designed to handle this much of instability. So we have significant amount of pumping problem. We have separation problem. We are monitoring issues in unconventional because of this fluctuating flow rates and phases. And so we have to rethink our lift design and lift application, lift operations approach. We need to consider the steep declines. We have to plan for wide range of production rates during the different phase of the well's production life. And that's where people are talking about life cycle of the artificial lifted well. And these are some of the very, very interesting and challenging topics that have come up and that are still being discussed today um, and they will, uh, some of these lessons are being applied back to conventional world also. Um, now let me uh, spend uh, another five, seven minutes uh, to talk about some of the, uh, a very interesting topic that is a uh, lot of hype is going on. Uh, so what I consider to be the post COVID era accelerator trends. And those are, as I said earlier, remote access, collaboration and the key enabler for that is what is under the umbrella of what is called digital oil field technology. So market forces demand doing more with the less, right? And um, so we have to think about some of the edge computing, artificial intelligence, machine learning and analytics. And we are gearing up to do lots of this, but there is a lot that needs to be done. And the, as I said earlier, there is a lot of hype around those things. And then there are considerable number of practical applications that are being tried right now, though people do not talk about it as much, okay? So your takeaway from this section should be digital oil field is here to stay. It's not a question of when or how, it's a question of, it's not a question of if, but it's a question of when and how. Why we are not doing it, that, that's what people are saying more and more. Real-time technologies are mature. It is not a question of technologies not being available. But what we need to focus on is that on the data stream that will come at us, are we prepared to handle it on the analytics side? And that goes back to the earlier statement that I made that you need to understand your hydraulics, you need to understand some mechanical, electrical engineering and environmental aspect in order to perform analytics properly. You cannot just throw some data science tools at it and expect some better tools. Uh, we have to also understand the limitations of some of these approaches. Limitations in the sense that what is possible, meaning we should not be buying into the hype. We have to focus on 
we will get a better visibility, better data quality. Our response time would be a lot better. Our downtime. Downtime is something that people are beginning to look at it very seriously because it leads to lots of deferred production. There are increased OPEX considerations and such. Okay, so here is a simple picture of production system optimization. On the y-axis, you have uh, revenues, x-axis, you have uh, time or the, rather the money, y-axis and time. So with time, your revenues are going to decline because it's a decline of the productivity, but your operating costs or the overall capex and opex are going to increase. At some point, both of them intersect. Right. So the difference between revenue and cost is your profitability. At some point, your profitability becomes negative and that's the time to shut in or plug and abandon. What if you are able to push your revenues up slightly higher, push your costs down slightly lower? And this slightly I'm using some vague term, but whatever, two, five percent you're talking about. What has happened in the process? Your profitability envelope has expanded. But not only that, this is very important thing that most of the people miss that shut-in is delayed, meaning you are recovering more barrels from the ground that would have been otherwise lost due to plug-in. So we are trying to do more with less for longer. And that is the mantra nowadays, right? So we are talking about maximizing not production. Maximizing production is just one goal of production system optimization. We are talking about maximizing the profits over the life of the valve. Right? We are talking about reducing the downtime, as I said earlier, minimizing the operating costs, improving the HSE and such, extending the economic well life. These are some of the trends that are going to accelerate because everybody's talking about now how we can get more done with less number of resources and for longer time, right? Now, manually, we have been doing this. We have been sending people out to the field to check on the wells, to compare with how the well was doing, how the well is doing compared to yesterday, meaning we are doing verification by observation. But this is what COVID era has taught us is that these approaches are not uh, possible, especially when we have pandemic situation like that. And otherwise also from health and safety security standpoint, we would not like our operators to spend two to three hours behind the uh, wheels of their vehicle just to go to some remote well site, just to check whether the well is working or not, right? And our observation frequency also goes down because it is depending upon the manpower. Whereas if we have some of these uh, digital oil field initiatives, then we can have frequent observation. Like right now we have audiences all the way from, I would say some Asia Pacific region through here in the uh, Americas. And that is being made possible through this go to webinar, right? So similarly, why we are not doing, why we are not talking to our wells remotely? So what are the enablers for that? And here you're seeing on the left side, different types of well installations, including pipelines. And we have been lowering some type of sensors that measure pressure, temperature, speed, uh, whatever. And then you have some type of concentrator, what is called RTU or remote terminal unit and that streams the data back via some communication channel to the main office where we have cloud-based data networks increasingly and we have some sort of number crunching going on either in cloud or on the company servers and then there are a variety of people either they are based in the field office or they are based in the corporate uh, looking at uh, data management supply chain and such and then you can have some remote collaborators um, like uh, SMEs or engineers or service company personnel who can keep an eye on the well, who can talk to the well, who can understand what is happening. And there's a lot of work being done in this area. I mentioned one word, edge analytics, right? So these RTUs are now becoming, getting more and more power, getting more and more number crunching abilities. We are transferring some of these algorithms on this so that it, they do not become merely monitoring and control, but also some intelligent decision-making machines, okay? So we need to move beyond dashboards. We need to go from retrospective or post-failure analysis of our operations data to descriptive, meaning more visualization. Many of us are using now uh, different uh, visualization uh, tools um, and uh, 
but we need to go towards more like predictive when the things are going to happen when my wells productivity would decline when my system is going to fail and then what do i do about it that is a prescriptive side of it right here i'm quickly showing you and uh, i'm quickly showing you some of the sagd wells uh, visualization uh, and what this shows is the temperature that is being measured using distributed temperature sensing in a SAGD well that is operated using ESP and how we are analyzing this data in real time, visualizing it in real time. Okay, this is another example of a paper that uh, I co authored some time ago where we looked at not only visualizing but also coming to the predictive side of it, how we can predict the static bottom hole pressure and PI in real time using this streaming data and such. And this is the one topic that people make lots of noises and we need to start looking at this carefully, particularly the analytics side. Uh, not all of it is good, but not all of it is bad either. There is uh, definitely some value in looking at some of these approaches in solving particularly some of our operational problems and some of our decision making tools and here is one example that i have borrowed from one of the companies how they are using machine learning to manage the rod pump wells uh, in real time in the field and they were they are able to demonstrate that using these approaches they are able to improve the profitability improve the uptime and reduce the downtime okay uh, but then there are some problems that we have to look at it also as we start putting in different data infrastructures that we do not create silos of the data that are contradictory to each other. We have to have a unified data sources so that the entire organization look at the same data and not different versions of the truth, as they say. So we have to focus more on data and that is where our role as an artificial lift expert comes in, as a product, production or petroleum engineer comes in. Because oftentimes we know that sometimes equipments are not properly recorded or installed correctly. Sometimes our data is not measured. So how do we make up for those type of missing data and such? And that is where the collaboration with a variety of disciplines comes in. Um, okay, uh, so we have to, except that the digital oil field has been implemented many places though it may not have realized its full potential we have numerous success stories we have made advances in well site controllers edge devices data capture transmission our ai ml and edge devices are invading are we ready for it that is a question each of us have to ask ourselves and some of these themes will be exploring right and that brings me to the end of my presentation. I hope I was able to give you some flavor of what are the artificial lift trends, how the world is changing, uh, what we are doing about it, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so Sharam, um, this is my last slide. We can have some questions uh, if you have time. Uh, yes, sure. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chokri, to accept our invitation so for this uh, comprehensive presentation on the subject of artificial uh, leaf. I think we have time for uh, questions. And um, sorry also for the audiences. It, seem, it seems that we had some problems from my side to uh, hearing my voice. I hope that now it's okay. Uh, yeah. At least uh, you, Dr. Rajan, if you hear me very well, just confirm that I make sure that everything is okay. Okay. All right. Yes. So, uh, yes. Yeah. We have uh, one question from uh, one of audience. And the question is that why um, ESP produce most oil? Okay. That's the question we have got. Yeah. Okay, that, that, that's a very good, uh, interesting question. Uh, so again, uh, as I showed, ESPs use the centrifugal um, principle, as I showed in the cutout, right? And um, we are able to, at the end of the day, you have to understand, are we able to deliver sufficient energy to generate the necessary TDH? Okay, now as your volume increases, so does your 
requirement for the energy. So as your flow rates increases, your requirement to deliver the energy at the downhole device increases. ESPs are very good at, uh, I mean, the ESP industry has developed very high power motors and also developed the pumps that can handle the high flow rate within a smaller space. Think about it. You have maybe five and a half inch casing or maybe you have seven inch casing and here. So all you're working with is about three inch diameter space to generate this. So that is the reason why ESPs are darling whenever it comes to the producing uh, higher volume, right? So you are able to provide, again, I'll repeat, you are able to provide higher density of energy downhole to a machine that is highly efficient. 